All right. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Middle East Forum's weekly podcast series. My name is Anaf Kalam, and I will be moderating today's discussion. We are pleased to be joined by Benam Ben Taliblu, a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Dem Defense of Democracies. Join us today to discuss the topic, If Iran Attacks Israel. Mr. Taliblu will speak for 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience. If you would like to ask a question, you can feel free to use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Mr. Benam Ben Taliblu. Thank you so much, Anaf. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, let me just say from a distance, I've uh, been a longtime reader of the good material that Middle East Forum puts out, particularly the journal Middle East Quarterly. If you don't uh, read it religiously, I highly recommend that you do. Okay, so uh, with some of these uh, introductions out of the way, let's pivot to the region uh, where things are quite likely to go boom. And with immense respect, I'm gonna tweak that title because it's looking very much like a matter of when and not if the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, would again overtly and directly attack Israel from its own territory. You know, we have a saying in Persian and, and the saying is, Tarset Richt, it literally translates to your fear has dropped. And the, the drop imagery is supposed to be like dropping a glass or a bucket of water, a liquid that rushes all the way to the bottom. And the fear of the Islamic Republic after April 13, April 14, of an overt and direct but limited military confrontation against the Israelis has dropped. Uh, you know, this was a country, a regime, I should say, that had a four plus decade uh, shadow war uh, against the Jewish state as well as against the Americans. But increasingly, uh, with the erosion of deterrence, uh, with the ability to increasingly danger, uh, dangle uh, its escalating nuclear program as some kind of sort of Damocles against Israeli pressure, against American pressure in particular, uh, it has been able to allow itself a limited war option while denying others a limited war option against it. And then behind this entire evolution in the strategic thinking of the Islamic Republic is a newfound military capability that is actually underwriting a greater risk tolerance that we're seeing by this regime uh, than ever before. While, for instance, you may see a lot of friends of Middle East Forum and a lot of friends of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, the think tank that I've been working at for almost 12 plus years now here in the heart of the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., uh, talk about things like the Reagan strategy against Iran or talk about things like going after the Iranian Navy. Uh, the present era has created lots of credibility crises that allow us to kind of immediately revert to that, uh, such that what may have been a, to paraphrase uh, the late great uh, Professor Bernard Lewis, what may be a deterrent to some is an inducement to others. Uh, there was a time when simply bringing more ships into the region would have uh, pushed back some of these Iranian capabilities, be they regional, be they nuclear, be they missile, or, or any other kind of threat matrix that they pose. Now the regime sees these as opportunities. This is quite literally what the commander of the aerospace force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Amir Ali Hajizadeh, uh, has been saying. And this is brought to you by the growing lethality, range, precision, maneuverability, and reliability of its ballistic missile force. You've had now for roughly two decades, uh, perhaps just a touch under, uh, multiple American directors of national intelligence attest to the Islamic Republic of Iran being home to the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. And in the first four months of 2024, the Islamic Republic actually employed these ballistic missiles in overt, direct, and attributable attacks against two nuclear-armed countries, Pakistan in January, admittedly what they claimed was against the Sunni uh, Baluch separatist groups, uh, as well as against uh, Israel uh, in April of 2024 during a military operation that they called True Promise, or in Persian, Vade Sadeh. The ability for the Iranians to manage the politics after each strike also underwrites the next cycle of escalation. And if you look since 2017, since the Iranians began to able to use these more precise, 
uh, ballistic missiles in their operations. There have been about 14, I think now, uh, overt direct military operations involving ballistic missiles from Iranian territory. Some of you may not know, but in September 2022, uh, a ballistic missile attack for the first time ever by the Islamic Republic killed an American citizen. Uh, a Kurdish American who was in northern Iraq when the regime was firing at Iraqi Kurdistan as it attempted to distract attention from the threat on the home front, and that was with the spread of the Women Life Freedom Movement in 2022 and 2023. So as these missile capabilities grow, the threshold to use them has been diminishing. And with the employment of them against the Israelis starting in April 13, April 14, uh, the regime is looking to find a way to continue its strategy of death by a thousand cuts, but on steroids now. The fact that every single Iranian military operation involving these projectiles is framed as being in response to something uh, also allows the Iranians the ability to use this large arsenal, given that they're framing this as being in response to the killing of Ismail Haniya, the head of uh, Hamas's political uh, bureau, even though I don't believe in this kind of needless uh, bifurcation that a lot of press and analysts uh, ascribe onto that Iran-backed terrorist organization uh, on Iranian territory. Make no mistake that the cascading term across the Iranian hardline press uh, was the word khunkhahi, which translates to bloodlust, actually. Uh, the regime is looking to basically wash away blood with blood, and that's why, unlike between April 1 and April 12, where there was a flurry of diplomatic activity, the regime has really pushed away um, from a lot of that diplomatic, if you will, mediation, uh, at least publicly this go around, with the only major round being uh, Jordan's foreign minister coming to Tehran to meet with the new Iranian president, Masoud Pazishkian, as well as the, uh, you could say, remaining or acting foreign minister, uh, Mr. Bob Arikani. Uh, it's unclear that the foreign minister, who probably called for de-escalation, was able to achieve what he wanted, because the Iranians believe they need to be seen as overtly and directly responding to the very public humiliation uh, imposed on them by the killing of one major head of an element of the axis of resistance uh, who was in Tehran, who was in their nation's capital. And if you follow some of the Persian press, you'll note that the regime has been trying to do everything it can to cover up the fact that this was a botched security uh, force issue at the heart of uh, the killing of Hania. Uh, if you look at the New York Times reporting, if you look at the Axios reporting, it's quite clear to me uh, that uh, the regime indeed did botch the security of that facility, which was uh, part of which was for Ismail Haniyeh, given that they said a bomb was planted about five and a half weeks before that individual got there. They likely were able to trace or detect where he would go, given the fact that since October 7, Ismail Haniyeh has twice uh, gone to Tehran. Uh, so they may have been able to tail him or track his cell phone or whatever else one believes. Uh, but nonetheless, the pre-planting of the bomb has been rejected by the Iranian hardline media. They're saying there was a projectile with a seven kilogram warhead fired externally, and they've spent countless time uh, uh, and resources in their press and even in their aligned social media to try to push back on this narrative of security force penetration. And the reason that this narrative is being pushed back by regime elites is because uh, there has really been a string really in the past 10 to 15 years uh, of covert activity on, Iran, on Iranian soil that highlights the shortcomings of this force and reminds everybody that the only thing this force can really do is the mass grotesque domestic suppression that we've seen in multiple iterations of street protests, particularly since 2017, when people pushed away from reform and are now seeking wholesale revolution or change of the system in its entirety, rather than settling for a factional reshuffling. And you've even had a former Iranian intelligence minister, I think back from 2021, uh, say that the Islamic Republic's officials should not be sleeping soundly or should not be considered safe at night given the level of this penetration. You know, lest we forget, I think about six or seven Iranian nuclear scientists have been killed on Iranian soil. Now we've had one member of the acts of resistance killed on Iranian soil. Two or three missile engineers have been killed on Iranian soil. You've had one member of the IRGC in uniform killed on Iranian soil. You've had multiple cyber attacks and even kinetic attacks on Iranian military facilities like drone storage units, uh, uh, over the past few years. You've had cyber attacks against critical infrastructure. You've had the Stuxnet virus back in the day. And by the way, you've had the theft of the nuclear archive by the Israelis way back in 2018. So when you put this picture together, it is not a good report card uh, for the state of the regime's security forces. And that's why there is all this projection. And that's why the regime throughout its press this week has been talking very publicly about another public military operation.
And had U.S. or Israeli deterrence been functioning at the highest of levels, it would have, in my view, been able to tamp this down. But as you know, the Biden administration is seeking a uh, contradictory or conflicted course in the region. It talks about, from one side of its mouth, the desire for de-escalation and diplomacy, but from the other side of its mouth, the desire for deterrence. You cannot achieve these two things at once. In fact, once you achieve one, you likely fail to be able to provide the other. If you're de-escalating, you may not be able to signal the commensurate resolve to bolster your deterrence. And if you are engaging in a deterrent mission, you are likely not going to be able to engage in de-escalation because you may need to climb the escalation ladder to really cement uh, that deterrence. So given this contradiction the Biden administration finds itself in, uh, the regime is likely, again, uh, going to make it a matter of when and not if uh, they use these overt and direct weapons of war. And their press has talked about different attack vectors and for the first time layering on Iranian attacks against Israel uh, with proxy attacks against Israel. There's specific reference to the capabilities of the Houthis in Yemen, which essentially for a non-state group have the military of a state. They're the only proxy of Iran with medium range ballistic missiles. They're the only proxy of Iran with anti-ship ballistic missiles. These are really game-changing long-range strike capabilities. Uh, the regime has talked about what Lebanese Hezbollah could do. There is increasing reference on social media about what the Iran-backed Shia militias in Iraq could do. They have shorter range projectiles like short range ballistic missiles, as well as we think land attack cruise missiles, as well as a variant of that Shahed Delta Wing one-way attack drone as well. So when you add this up, the regime is likely in the moment of trying to coordinate proxy and patron firepower against the Jewish state to try to kind of bolster its deterrence, but bolster its image of being seen as responding, which they think will go quite away um, uh, in its kind of death by a thousand cut strategy against Israel and securing its strategy as well as underwriting its values of death to Israel. For those of you who are uh, close followers of Iranian uh, domestic politics, you know that this, these are things that the regime has not been shy about saying or doing. I'm reminded of a Khamenei quote back from 2012, uh, where he says that, you know, they would support anybody who is basically fighting the Israelis. Uh, that stuff has grown on steroids now. And that's why you can't afford to disconnect the dots, particularly in the post-October 7th Middle East, between patron and proxy. So we are teetering on the edge of a potential region-wide conflict. That's why the U.S. has moved at least 4,000 additional U.S. service persons, plus lots and lots of more uh, air and missile defense assets that will have the ability to engage in a more integrated missile and air defense architecture plug in with the fact that Israel is now in CENCOM since 2020. That was one of the big moves under the late end of the Trump administration that allows for more of this interoperability, more of this image sharing, but also to bring in Arab partners and European partners online to deny these Iranian projectiles. But as technically complex as all of this sounds, that may be the easy part, because if there is no deterrence by punishment to follow that deterrence by denial, we will likely find ourselves in the future having another iteration of this conversation where the regime feels that its fear has dropped once again and that it can afford to continue to dangle its conventional options and not just its potential nuclear option against the Israelis to push its strategy forward. And I think uh, with that mouthful and that kind of 360 degree picture, I'll end there and try to make sure that we have ample time uh, for Q&A, given how topical this to uh, this uh, issue is. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, that, was, uh, that was an excellent presentation, very timely as well. Uh, I'll begin with a question from uh, the Middle East Forum President Daniel Pipes. He says, thank you for the excellent survey. Would you say Iranian leaders are, in the final analysis, afraid or not afraid of Israel's power? I think the regime is beginning to move. Certainly, they fear Israeli capabilities. Uh, there was a comment, I think, by a year and a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, by the Armed Force General Staff Major Bagheri, uh, Major General Bagheri, who was listing out Iranian uh, threats to Iranian security, and America was not even in the top three, uh, but certainly the Israelis were. So they understand, in terms of the capabilities, uh, the threats that the Israelis can pose. But now. 
I would say that because the Israelis are not able to win the politics war, the regime feels that it can use military means to achieve its political ends, whereas the U.S. and the Israelis remain stymied in using military means to only accomplish military ends. And that's a very dangerous position for the Israelis to be in. Unfortunately, I would say, uh, of the course of the past three administrations, that's a position that we've been somewhat stuck in, and the Iranian people, the Iranian government, uh, has been unable has been able to unfortunately masterfully exploit between Obama and Trump and Biden uh, to dangle that prospect of a larger war and to gut our resolve rather than our capability. I don't think the Iranians should misjudge the resolve of the Israelis, particularly after 10 months against Hamas in Gaza, holding back a multi-front uh, war in the region, as well as going after Hania, uh, but by constantly threatening uh, that this could get out of hand or that the Israelis uh, cannot manage it any longer. I think the regime is, is beginning to believe its own propaganda, and that's a dangerous position to be in, and that makes conflict more and not less likely. So forgive me for that long-winded answer, but I do think the regime understands and fears and appreciates it, but is now trying to employ a similar strategy against the Israelis that it has unfortunately successfully employed against the Americans. Well, thank you. Um, now, Israel currently is anticipating retaliation for the assassination of Ismail Haniya and other senior Hamas and Hezbollah leaders, uh, which may well come on multiple fronts. Now, do you think that this attack might be more or less effective than the April attack on Israel, where we saw that a good number of the rockets and drones that were fired by Iran were intercepted by the Saudi and Jordanian air defense before they could even reach Israel? And critically, I would say, in terms of the low and slow flying drones, which were fired first, uh, intercepted between Iraq and Jordan, uh, simply with the machine guns of the US F-16s and other uh, air power that existed. And there's a sharp contrast one can draw with Ukraine, where those munitions may not be there or may not be there in full. And the Russians certainly have more air power. Uh, and that's why Iranian drones work, for lack of a better word, in Ukraine, but don't work, for lack of a better word, as they have to traverse this trajectory towards Israel. They are low and slow. They can be shot down. Um, so that also was one major handicap the regime had. Here, I think it's a question of if the regime is going to up the volume or up the quality, but I certainly think it wants to up the lethality. Uh, even in their hardline press this week, they've been talking a lot about uh, going after kind of the defense industrial base of the Israelis rather than limited targeting of the bases. They've talked about uh, how they want to do a 360 degree attack. So you could have simpler munitions potentially from Hezbollah or the Houthis uh, designed to overwhelm the same target from the north and the south. Uh, this is always an option. Uh, unfortunately, I think the regime does have a lot to play with, and uh, there is ample question as to how well could they militarily coordinate different iterations of a multi-directional attack. Um, but what the regime has also said, at least in its uh, semi-official media, and again, no official has said this, but the semi-official media has hinted that converse uh, contrast to April 13, 14, where it was about a couple of hours long operation, this would be a several days long operation, kind of lulling you into a false sense of security and then escalating again and then lulling you such that you have what General McKenzie called would take over the region, which is a, a series of precision fires wars. Well, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Stephen Holstein, who asks, how can Iran continue to arm itself, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and the Iraqi Shia militias, given that its currency has been in free fall for quite some time now? Its currency has been in free fall, but it has unfortunately been able to generate significant revenues under the Biden administration's policy of unenforced oil sanctions. I think the first major attempt to enforce these penalties came in May 2022. Uh, that's a year and a half into the administration. Uh, and still now you still have some record setting highs of uh, oil flows and even petrochemical flows, which you can sell at higher than uh, the oil barrel price. Uh, going to East Asia, particularly to China. And that is even with the insurance issues and ship-to-ship -ship transfers and the whole uh, undistributed middles of the costs of basically engaging in a smuggling operation on the high seas. Nonetheless, a couple of things to point out. If you remember way back in the day, in the days of Saddam, in the days of Hafez al-Assad, in the days of Gaddafi, the trend line in the region was the bad guys have scuds, the good guys have jets. 
Uh, this, a lot of this has changed, particularly with the Islamic Republic being the region's uh, preeminent missile arsenal now, because they are the bad guy now with, with the projectiles. Uh, but these are, in essence, weapons of the weak, that we don't mean to devalue them or to rob them of that precision or that lethality. The worst thing we can do is to rob an adversary of agency or to not take the threats that they make seriously. But when I say weapons of the weak, is that that which we have to spend, we here in the West have to spend to credibly track and intercept and then de de destroy these projectiles is much, much more expensive uh, than the projectiles that then they have to fight. And that's what I mean by weapons of the weak. So costs are always relative. That's one thing to keep in mind. And when you look at what DOD, unfortunately, is struggling with, and I think that's what General Carrilla a few weeks ago when he sent that famous letter that I think the Wall Street Journal reported on about the shortcomings of the operation in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden to, to intercept uh, a lot of these Houthi munitions, it was evident to me that DOD was on the wrong side of the cost curve there, that we're paying so much more uh, to intercept these munitions that do not cost this much, and we're unable to affect the strategic calculus with this interception mission of the people firing these projectiles. And that's what we have to remember. Great, thank you. Now, Kerry Hillebrand asks, is there any evidence of fracturing in the Iranian regime or IRGC that may lead to regime instability, if not regime change? There is significant fracturing, uh, but this is much more of a vi of a video kind of issue or a you know recorder issue, a story of change over time rather than a snapshot that I can present to you. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you haven't had the kind of major elite fracturing in the traditional sense, but you've had the elite slicing. For example, uh, someone that the regime did not permit to run uh, in the 2021 and current uh, electoral contest that brought about Masoud Pazishkian uh, is someone like Larry Jani. The Larry Jani's have been likened to the Kennedys of Iran, for example. I'm doing the political level first because it's more overt and easier to detect. Um, so you've had a narrowing of the ultra hardline elite. Um, you've likely uh, had that with the IRGC as well. I remember during the time of the killing of uh, Mohsen Fakhrizad and Mahabadi, the country's chief nuclear scientist in uh, November 2020, uh, at the tail end of that year, there was a very good BBC report that actually at the end of its assessment of how the Israelis may have been able to puncture the Iranian security state mentioned that there actually were parts of Evin prison, that famous notorious political prison in Tehran, uh, that were just devoted uh, for uh, having some of where they would throw, you know, misbehaving IRGC or what they would deem was unloyal IRGC. Uh, you've had the regime even very recently kind of engage in a mass arrest policy after the killing of Hania. We don't know if this is political theater or if they're randomly taking people, but they understand how penetrated they are. That penetration has not led to overt political fracture in the military establishment yet, uh, but it's something to keep your eyes on in the future. But me, a proponent of pressure, would be content with us escalating pressure over time, even though in the short term, opponents of pressure would say this makes regime elites more cohesive. I would say yes, in the short term, hence my allusion to a video rather than a snapshot, because in the short term, the theory of pressure says that those elites that they are cutting themselves, plus created by the structural conditions would come together. But once you have them together and you continue to squeeze, now these more like-minded elites have to compete with one another over that dwindling pool of resources. And as they continue to face domestic pressure and exogenous pressure, be it political, economic, and even military, uh, they will make mistakes. And then when they make mistakes, those are the opportunities for the West and for America and Israel and even the Iranian people to be able to capitalize on. So there is no one snapshot I can provide to you to say that this would be a prospective ability for us to transition to a better regime change policy. But I can make the case of how to move the theory of maximum pressure from behavior change to a regime change option if it is given the sufficient time to be able to be employed. Thank you. Now, Paul Ross would like to ask, since the Iranians almost certainly will attack, what are the chances the Israelis will attack preemptively? And if so, what could such an attack look like? 
I think right now, preemptively, the Israelis would not attack. It depends also if you mean by preemptively an attack against a facility that they believe the Iranians hold dear, kind of in that Schellenkian sense, threaten that which they hold dear, and the hopes that the damage they incurred by, I don't know, a, a missile attack against some military facility, for example, would be sufficient to deter or dissuade them. A, I don't think the Israelis are in that world yet, but B, the kind of thinking that would be able to say, hey, we're watching you consistently, would be brought to you by an ISR capability that the Americans have at the 500,000 foot level versus the Israelis. And in military terms, uh, no pun intended, these are called LOL uh, or left of launch operations, kinetic and electronic warfare, and even cyber options against the specific munitions and command and control networks to launch those munitions. Um, I don't see the Israelis or even the Americans uh, by any public indication that I've seen, be willing to embrace the risks that would come with either a strike in the Schellingian sense to threaten that which they hold dear before the regime launches, or to be able to connect those dots on command and control and engage in a left of launch operation against those specific nodes that would be firing those missiles. So I think that uh, is where we are today. Thank you. Now, uh, to follow up, Stephen Miller would like to ask, uh, does Iran see the U.S. as unwilling to retaliate for a major attack on Israel? Um, unfortunately, almost yes, almost certainly, I should say. When we look at the April 13, April 14 attack, one major force that redounded to the security dividend of the Islamic Republic was the uh, politically, unfortunately, rightly placed gamble or risk or assessment by the regime that in the commencement of a scenario that could lead to a significant escalation, the Americans would come down harder on the partner that was their ally rather than the partner that was their adversary so as to stem that escalation spiral. Uh, that continues to be borne out in the rhetoric of the Biden administration today. The second kind of force operating in the background is, again, that threat of nuclear escalation. And that's precisely why both before and after uh, April, you've had a lot of Iranian officials kind of come out and talk about a, a bomb in the basement option. Or in February 2024, you had Saleh, the former atomic energy chief, talk about uh, a, a nuclear bomb being like a car. And they just have to drop the engine in, or even in this turbulent period between April 1st and April 13th and April 19th, you've had an IRGC official from a command that we don't even really know of, the Nuclear Security Command, uh, talk about essentially pushing Iran towards that military option. And together, this kind of nuclear escalation threat, plus the political prospect, uh, the, 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 the politics threat of, of a wider regional war, together magnify as uh, forces that the regime can use to handcuff Israel. And uh, it is a dubious political situation when an adversary like the Islamic Republic, who calls America the great Satan, can also count on said great Satan to restrain said little Satan, which is Israel in the parlance of the Islamic Republic. Yeah, thank you. Now, um, uh, we're uh, getting close to the end here. I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, Stephen Gilbert would like to ask, Will the U.S. pressure Israel not to go on the offensive? Will the U.S. Will the U.S. pressure Israel not to go on the offensive? I think all indications point to that. Again, election season, oil, prospect, price changes, particularly given the status of the stock market today, um, as well as past its prologue given the April 13, April 14, and the successful interceptions, uh, coupled with, obviously, that conflicting mission for de-escalation versus deterrence. You add those four forces together, and you get an equation for American restraint and pressure against Israel that ends up functioning in that deterrent dividend favoring the Islamic Republic, at least politically, like I answered in the previous question. So if all else equal, those four forces will be at play. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have unfortunately reached the end of our podcast for this week. Uh, I want to thank you again, Benam, for taking the time to join us this week and bless us with your encyclopedic knowledge of the region. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Great to be with you all. It's a pleasure as well. Uh, and for our viewers and listeners in our audience, is there somewhere where they can go where they can follow more of your work? Uh, sure. Uh, I have a page on the FDD website. That's fdd.org. 
uh, frankdeltadelta.org. I have a page there that has a lot of my writings and analysis and commentary, as well as media appearances. And then while I don't have a social media presence, the FDD underscore Iran Twitter uh, account uh, amplifies the work of myself and many of the other Iran experts in, in the organization. All right. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who uh, will be watching this on the YouTube recording, I will be sure to drop those links in the description of the video here. But once again, uh, we want to thank you all for joining us and for your participation. Please be sure to join us on Wednesday for our Israel Insider podcast with Ashley Perry. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks.